the song we sang, on the room mark of suffering. I want you to think about maybe a point in your life in which you experienced that road, um, part of a journey. In fact, that image of the road has become more common for us um, around our church. It's, it's becoming an image that we're collecting a lot of things around. Um, because a road is um, something you can't see the whole thing on. It's got different parts to it. Some are uh, pretty well paved. They're, they're smooth. They're nice. Maybe you're coasting. Other parts of the road is coming around the corner and you're not sure what's on the other side. Um, there's long uphill pole sometimes. Um, other places you're trying to see to make out the road where it is. And so we're going to be talking to you a lot in the next months about uh, kind of concepts of the road and the journey and how your life and everything fits into that series right after Easter. Um, it's going to be called At the Crossroads and, and really talking about how there's always this uh, bringing together of faith and life that God is, is pulling for us. So we're going to be talking about more um, in terms of that. I said a lot of times we get the idea that that this is where we learn about God. You know, you come to a to the church, you come to a worship gathering, and here's where we learn about God. I would almost suggest the opposite is true. It's out there where we learn about God. Here's kind of where you get the framework for understanding what goes on. There. And um, when those things happen, and, and when both good and bad times take place. Um, it's when you line that up with the Word of God where you start to say, okay, this is this is what that means. This is how that makes sense. This is how I can navigate those kind of things. But then you go out there, and that's really where you spend most of your time. And I think that's really where you learn about God. And that is the story of Joseph, which really this road of suffering. And this is a young man that learned an incredible lesson about God's faithfulness. I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, I want to say tonight that the best lessons are lived. And that is really true. The things that really stick are the things that you live out, the things that you experience. Uh, I see some of you already taking little notes. I, some people try to fill these in before I even start. Chris Brasher. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room does that. I always like playing those games, you know, where if I can figure them out, then I win. So use this however you want. If you don't like filling in blanks, you can use the back side of this. But there might be a couple notes on here you'd like to take. Um, I have all kinds of life experiences where I've learned stuff. Um, I, I could not tell you the top five sermons I've ever heard in my life, and I'm a communicator. All right, I could not tell you the five top preaching or message events that I've been part of, but I can tell you events in my life where I learned that God is faithful, where it really drove home to me that God is patient, that He's forgiving. I mean, those are the times I've learned about the character of God. Um, I mean, filling in blanks is great, but again, that's some framework stuff. But really, where the lesson was driven home was living life. Um, it's true in a lot of other things, too. I could not tell you what I learned in driver's education. I take one in high school. But I can tell you from experience that it is not good to put on the brakes when you're driving on ice. It's just a life lesson. And I also learned that it takes a long time to get a tow truck after a snowstorm once you put on the brakes while driving on ice. Just how it is. I have a scar on this finger um, where I learned how to use a chisel in my dad's wood shop. Good lesson. Um, I have a den on the back of my truck where I learned that they don't make the old parking garages as big as they make the new parking garages. Um, I have all kinds of things. I, I have a window in the um, closet of my master bedroom where I learned that you always measure twice when ordering custom built windows. I bet you've got some life lessons too, buddy. Somebody gave me this book uh, when I was kind of just out of college. It's called The University of Hard Knocks. And uh, chapter one, he calls life experience, he calls it the greatest school. He says this, the greatest school is the University of Hard Knocks. Its books are bumps. Every bump is a lesson. If we learn a lesson with one bump, we do not get that bump again. We do not need it. We have traveled beyond it. They do not waste the bumps. We get promoted to the, to the next bump. Some of us learn to go forward with a few bumps, but most of us are naturally bright and have to get pulverized. The tuition on the University of Hard Knocks is not free. Experience is the dearest teacher in the world. Most of us spend our lives in the ABCs of getting started. We begin on the credit, we never graduate. When we stop learning, we're due for another moment. Tonight we're going to talk about really life experience and how that ties in. Uh, the Bible is filled with advice like that that says it's about uh, living it out. Proverbs are filled with all kinds of uh, messages like that. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. 
Uh, correction comes as you're living out life and then says, hey, don't do that again. And you might choose to do it again and learn from experience or you can keep somebody else's advice. Jesus, too, there's this great passage some of you are familiar with. Um, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden or weary and I will give you rest. So you might know that passage. The very next verse, though, Jesus says this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So it's as you suffer with Jesus, as you take on the burden of following him. Um, he says, I know all about suffering. He says, learn from me, take my yoke upon me, and learn from me, and you will discover that I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What I'd like to do with you tonight is uh, maybe unfold that story of Joseph a little bit. And I'd like to kind of throw out maybe a, a premise, I guess, at the start of this. Um, the fact that somebody is transformed through the road of suffering and difficulty. And it's an amazing process when you see that happen, either in somebody else's life or in your own life. Um, and uh, I want to throw out kind of this concept and then spend the rest of the time developing it. Here's the concept. Faithful leaders are in tune with God's faithfulness. Right, let me say it one more time. Faithful leaders are in tune with God's faithfulness. And here's the thing. I mean, history is filled with examples of people who became great leaders, but their paths were not easy. They went through a lot of difficulty to become great. And I want to ask the question, how did they become great leaders and not just bitter people. And Joseph is one of those people too. Um, we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 41. And so what I want to do today is take somebody who's a great leader and then backtrack all the way to when he was 17 years old and figure out what went into his life to develop that kind of character. So Genesis 41, if you want to open your Bibles tonight, um, do we have some boxes of Bibles here? Are they out? I think they're nothing. They're missing tonight. That's okay. Um, does someone want to help the pregnant lady? They're missing. They're missing. Okay. You stole the Bible. Huh? All right. Well, um, some, I, I know some, you probably should help them. Okay. <laughs> well, while they're getting the Bible people um, out, <laughs> I see a couple Bibles here and there. You can just kind of listen along or else follow along with somebody who's got a Bible. We don't necessarily assume they're going to bring a Bible, so we try to provide those in beer boxes, which somebody cashed away. So, Genesis chapter 41, I want to begin with this statement that kind of declares what happened to Joseph. Um, and here it is. So, Pharaoh says to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. This is verse 41. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and people shouted before him, Make way. Then he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. This sounds to me like somebody who has achieved success. When you, doesn't that sound like it? Okay. So here he is, the second in command of all Egypt. This is the power of the known world at that time. And so let's back up. This is when he's 30 years old. He achieves this kind of success by 30 years old. Are you on track for being second in command of the whole country, the United States? Anyone? You have your goals? Matthew's yeah, thinking about it. All right. He might get there, but he's got more time than some of us by the time he's 30. Okay, we're going to back up to when he was 17, though. So we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 37. If you're having a hard time finding the book of Genesis, ask the person next to you. Okay? Genesis 37. Here begins the account of Joseph. His father is a man by the name of Jacob, sometimes called Israel. Now Joseph, a young man of 17, this is verse 2, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, beautiful names, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now two things are going to get off this verse. First of all, Joseph comes from a blended family. Does anybody here have stepbrothers or sisters? All right, Cecil, right in the middle. You come from good roots, Cecil. You are in good company. Joseph also came from a blended family. That's his roots, all right? I didn't know that when I was growing up. You didn't know that? <laughs> it was not a good thing. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a good thing. 